let's get started. Welcome to the first live session for DLS 105. Uh, this will be the live Q&A for Module 1. All right, so for homework, we are asked to draw an inventory using the following data and then to use this data to calculate the probability of failure. And we're told to perform a common cause adjustment on the system response probability. So to start, the best thing to do is to start with the event tree because that event tree is going to be our roadmap to the rest of the calculations. So we're given four different flood intervals. We've got no flood, minor flood, moderate flood, and major flood. Each of these are going to be represented by a branch in the event tree. And then coming off of each of these, is going to be branches for each of the failure modes, and there's five of them, in addition to a, uh, a non-breach branch. So when we draw our event tree, it's going to end up looking something like this. So again, I've got, in the first level of the event tree, I'm going to have four different branches to represent the four different um, flood ranges that were defined in the table. So we've got one for no flood, one for minor flood, one for moderate flood, and then the final one for major flood. And then coming off of each of these branches, again, we're going to have branches for each of the failure modes, one through five, but then we also have to add in this uh, no failure or no breach branch because based on the rules of event trees, all these branches must be um, collectively exhausted. So that's going to be what's left over, basically the probability of um, the dam or levy, whatever we're looking at, not failing. That's what our event tree is going to look like. So then to start filling these things out, I know what the flood probabilities are. Those are given, and those are going to go with the associated branch here in level one. So we've got a 0.54 probability for the no flood, uh, 0.31 for the minor, 0.14 for moderate, and then 0.01 for the major flood. Okay, so then the probabilities that are going to go into this next branch are going to be the system response probabilities from each of these failure modes, but after we perform the common cause adjustment. So let's go ahead and do that. So in our spreadsheet here, we've got um, a spot where we can calculate the system response complements. We do that, that makes uh, doing the common cause adjustment a little easier, so we're going to start with that. The complement of the system response is simply going to be one minus the marginal system response for the failure mode. So for PFM1, we're going to take one minus this first probability here in cell D8, zero, so my complement is going to be one. Now, because I'm going to be taking one minus all of these things, I can just drag down and over to finish out the rest of the table. And it's just taking that same formula that we put here and applying it to these other cells, but now referencing different cells. So for moderate flood and PFM4, I've got 1 minus 0 0.025 or 0.975. Okay? So that gives me all of the system response complements. So then now I have all the things I need to uh, do the common cause adjustment. So the common cause adjustment, I'm going to take the marginal probability, and I'm going to multiply it by 1 minus the product of the complements of all the different failure modes. That's going to be um, all five of these cells right here. And then I'm going to divide that by the sum of the marginal probabilities for all of the different failure modes, okay? So basically what I'm doing is I'm taking, I'm applying De Morgan's rule, which is in this, which is in the numerator right here, the one minus the product of the complements. So that's one minus the probability of none of them occurring, the union, all of them occurring, or any one of them, any combination. And then weight that by, the marginal system response probability that I'm looking at. So I'm going to take uh, the probability of PFM1 
and that's going to be divided by the sum of all the probabilities. So, in a sense, what we're doing is the, the failure mode that has the largest marginal probability is going to get a larger share of that total probability here. So then I can leverage Excel by locking the rows in the product and in the, excuse me, locking the, let's see, I'll do, which one do I want to lock? I want to lock the columns because I want the rows to move. So I'm going to put the dollar signs in front like so. And for this first probability, it's going to be zero. But when I drag these over, I'm now referencing PFM5 instead of um, PFM1. And I got the right formula. Okay? So really, the formula for each of these is going to be exactly the same. The only thing that's changing now is the, um, the system response probability at the beginning of the, uh, of the equation. Five is going to reference five. Four is going to reference four, so on and so forth. Okay. So then once those are set, I can drag those down to complete the rest of the table. Now, I could have just as easily, if I'd wanted to, instead of using, um, you know, the product function um, and the sum function, I could have just as easily um, typed it in a little differently. I could have done, um, taken each of these complements and just multiplied them together. That would have worked. And then summed them again there at the bottom. Then you need to be careful with if you were going to do that. Oops, sorry, I'm on the wrong row. The only thing you got to be careful with that is making sure that you have your parentheses in the right spot. But you get the same thing. Okay. So then one of the things that was, I guess, a common question during the office hours was how to, how to uh, calculate this non-breach probability. And if you remember, when we look at our event tree, each series of branches have to be collectively exhaustive. So that means that the sum of all these probabilities has to equal one. So what we assign the non-failure is going to be what's left over or one minus the sum of the adjusted system response probabilities for the flood loading that we're looking at. So I'm going to take one minus the sum of all of these adjusted system response probabilities and for this first um, flood loading, I get a non-breach probability of 0.78. I repeat that calculation for each of the flood loadings. Now I have all the probabilities that I need to um, fill out level two of my event tree. So I take those um, probabilities down. It's going to look something like this. So this first row these probabilities are going to get assigned to this first series of branches. So the 0.878 goes here, 0 here, 0 0.01 here, and on down the line. So I have each of them filled out. And then same thing for the minor flood, the major or the moderate flood, and then the major flood. Okay. So then to get my end node probabilities, I'm going to multiply through the different pathways of the tree. So for this first one, it's going to be the no flood times the no failure probability. I'm going to take my flood probability and multiply by the no failure probability. I'm going to go ahead and lock the column on this as well, because I'm going to take that same no flood probability and multiply by FM1, FM2, FM3, 4, and 5. So these are going to be the end nodes for this um, first set of branches. Again, I'm taking the flood probability multiplied by the adjusted system response probabilities I get to then get the end nodes. And then because I've locked this 
the column of this first cell. I can then grab this, drag it down, and that's going to be the rest of my end node probabilities. So just to repeat, so like for the minor flood, let's pick one, the end node for PFM2, that's going to be 0.31 times 0.047. I get a probability of 144 times 10 to the minus 2. So those will all go here at the end of the tree. Again, my flood loading times my adjusted system response to then get my end node probability. Okay? So if I've done everything right, remember everything should be um, collectively exhaustive. So I should be able to sum all of these together and I should get a probability of one. That's going to include all the different possible scenarios, failure and non-failure. I get a probability of one. So it looks like I did that right. Now, to get the total failure probability, the only thing I want to sum are the end nodes that result in failure. So in the event tree, these are going to be all the ones that have pathways that I've got marked as these red triangles for failure. So the blue ones for, are non-failure. We don't want to add those in. We're only going to be summing these red values. And the red values are the ones that are represented by these cells here. I will take the sum of all of those. I should get a total failure probability of 2.36 times 10 to the minus 1. Okay. So, again, the vast majority of you got this right, which is very good. Um, there was one participant that noted about how high that failure probability is, and no doubt, if we actually had a a structure with that um, failure probability, we would probably be quite concerned about it and be thinking about ways to uh, modify it to reduce the risk. Thankfully, this is just a made up example, so don't be too concerned about that failure probability. It's pretty high. Okay, so with that, I will open it up to questions related to uh, the homework. How did I create, create the event tree in Excel? Well, so what I did was I just, I just threw it out, basically. These are all just um, objects, so lines and triangles that I then grouped together. And then one thing that's handy in Excel is you can name your groups if you want. So I grouped the, um, the probabilities to make it easier to demonstrate this stuff, but really it's just text boxes with numbers in it that I've been grouped together. So you know, to draw it out, I was just using simple shapes and stuff. For our risk assessments, they're probably going to be a lot more involved than what I'm showing here. We're going to have a lot more um, partitions to define our flood loading ranges. You could do it this way, but it'd be pretty cumbersome. Um, if you wanted to draw it out in an event tree, I would, you know, the, the full tree, I'd probably use a program like Precision Tree, but otherwise we typically just um, would draw a condensed version of our, um, of our tree and then just do the calculations in a spreadsheet or uh, use a program like RMC Total Risk or even Damray for those of you who've been doing this for a while. All right, can I go over the end node probability calculation? And yeah, sure. So the end node probability, we're going to take our, again, simple or adjusted system response probabilities and our non-probabilities, and we're going to multiply those by the associated flood probability. So for this first one, I'm going to take 0.8. 7, 8 for my non-breach probability, and then multiply it by the flood probability. And then for the next branch, so for this one right here, that's going to be my 0.31 flood probability times a 0.73 probability. So I'm, all I'm doing is I'm taking the flood probability and multiplying it by either my non-breach probability or my adjusted system response probability. In terms of an event tree, I'm just following the, the different pathways, 0.54 times 0 0.878, 0 0.55 times 0 0.73, 0 0.75 times 0 0.75, 0 0.75 times 
0.54 times 0, 0.54 times 0.01, so on and so forth. 0.3 times 0 0.730, 0 0.31 times 0. And you just complete all of those different pathway calculations through the rest of the tree. So the question, there's a question that says this event tree is constructed explicitly consistent with the mathematical common cause adjustment that doesn't really represent the physical event tree. Um, not in, so by doing a common cause adjustment, we are assuming that um, failure modes cannot occur together. I can't have failure from both PFM1 and 2 at the same time or three and five or at the same time or any other combination. So if we were to do this, you know, I guess theoretically perfect with reality, we would have to have all of those different combinations. So I would have to have only failure mode one, only two, only three, only four, only five, one and two, one and three, so on and so forth until I have all of the different possible combinations. And yes, Derek, as you're pointing out, we, that is, we are doing that for mathematical convenience. And a lot of times the, those intersections are going to be such a small probability that, you know, it's not worth the calories going through to enumerate all of them. In addition, a lot of times the consequences associated with those failures are going to be the same, whether it's a failure of one or a failure of a combination of failure modes. So much simply, I can get, you know, the, the correct total probability of failure that I would if I'd enumerated everything with, you know, a negligible error in how I would calculate the average annual life loss later on. Yeah, very good. He says he's just pointing it out because the failure modes aren't exactly mutually exclusive, and that's correct. Very good. All right, so next question. If there is no flood, how can you still have the probability, possibility of PFM1 or any of the other failure modes? Well, if there's no flood, we can't have the probability of overtopping, and that's why those are assigned a, a system response probability of zero. Now, I can still have failure by any of the other, i.e. stands for internal erosion. I can have failure by any of those other internal erosion failure modes because the dam is still going to hold some kind of normal pool. Just because it says no flood doesn't exactly mean that there's no water on the dam. So under normal conditions, I'm going to have some level. And then um, when the flood comes, I would have an elevated level. and you know, a higher probability of initiating one of these failure modes. And as you notice, we'll have to get up to a fairly decent flood before overtopping starts to kick in. Uh, next question is, how do you adjust cells to get rid of scientific notation or not? That's just going to be... Make this thing go away. I can do it up here and just change it to number if I'd like, as opposed to scientific notation. I can also right click and go to format cells and do the same thing here. I can go number or scientific notation, however I want. So the next question is, De Morgan's rule is one minus the product of the system response complements, or is it one minus the product of one minus each product? Okay. So De Morgan's rule is going to be um, one minus the product of the system response complements. That's this right here. Let's move it out to the side. So again, it's one minus the product of those complements. It is the other way to do it, and this is probably what we saw, I guess, in the uh, in module one. I think we saw it this way too. 
It's one, also one minus the product of one minus the marginal system response probabilities. Oops, this one. And we should get the same thing there. Yeah, so the, again, the complement's going to be equal to one minus the marginal probability. Uh, and Dave, yes, to, to draw the event trees, yeah, in this instance, I just used the, the drawing tools in Excel. That's, that's correct. But for those of you who drew it by hand, some of them are actually pretty, very pretty. The straight edges and stuff look very nice. Yeah, you can draw them by hand. You can draw them in Excel. You can just rough out the tree and then do the uh, probability calculations within the spreadsheet. Or you can use, you know, a, a program like Precision Tree or Total Risk for Dam Ray to draw them out. And yes, you can also use cell borders to use lines in Excel. That's correct. Yep. Total risk available for download. Um, not quite yet. So they're still going through um, a final review on that. I've been told that it's going to be, it should become official this spring. Um, if for whatever reason that gets delayed and it doesn't become official by the time we get to module five, I think it is, then I've got a beta version that you guys will get to test out and try. Uh, we did that with the last offering, but um, if all goes well, the uh, official validated version should be up on the website in time for uh, module five later this spring. Uh, next question for lecture slide 74 and 75 about unimodal bounds. Can we apply this theorem to failure modes with different likelihood of failure, not just SRP? I'm thinking for SQA, we have different um, LOF. Is that, what do you mean by LOF? Is it levels of failure for? Yeah, likelihood of failure. Can you hear me? Sorry, say that one more time. Yes. Likelihood of failure. So I don't know if you can pull up the slide, but I have it if you want me to share screen. 74 and 75. Right. Quick. Okay. So this one, and also the, uh, the next slide, if you go to the 75. Mm -hmm. So in this example, right, uh, you know, you give uh, probabilities of three different failure modes for a given peak reservoir elevation, that's main dam overtopping, spillway, and cellar dam. So, you know, I'm kind of thinking from the SQRA, right, we may have likelihood of failure estimates for each of these different PFMs. Can we use the same, you know, the uh, the Morgan's theorem to calculate the upper bound for this. So for this is only... an SQ, yeah, yeah, yeah. So f I'm following. So for an SQRA, because we are not developing point estimates, we typically will not go through and do a common cause adjustment. Basically, we're saying that you know for a given failure mode, you know the probability of failure is within this order of magnitude. So because it's not quite as precise, we typically just um, use the exclusive risk model and just assume that there is no intersection and just sum everything up. Um, yeah. When we do a quantitative risk assessment, we will go through and when we report our total, we will do some sort of an adjustment typically. Typically common cause, you could do competing risk, or even joint risk if you had to. But then we give a nod to 
the unimodal balance theorem by plotting each failure mode that the marginal risk for each failure mode. So in a sense, we're, se we're showing the marginal probabilities on our plots, and you'll be able to look and say, well, here's the highest failure mode, here's the combination of the total, and if you're applying that theorem, you know, the, the true probabilities somewhere in between those two. Yeah. So this, this will become a little more clear when we get into module two. We'll talk about um, how we portray risk, um, we'll go over the common cause adjustment again, and that should make that more clear. But typically for SQRAs, because our um, risk estimates for the failure modes are not super precise, they're an order of magnitude, we just sum them up. We don't typically apply any okay. kind of common cause for intersections. Yeah, but even then, right, let's say you have two PFMs that's relatively similar. So if you decided not to sum them up, you may just choose one, right? And just carry that forward. Or, you know, say you have five different PFMs, two are relatively similar, and you may want to ignore one of them, right? Just for total risk, sum maybe for somewhat different PFMs together, rather than trying to make adjustments between PFMs that's relatively similar. Yeah, so I'm following. So yeah, I think you can do that, yeah. but again, you need to have, you need to be able to make the, the case for why you're doing that. So let's say you've got, like in this example, let's say that, you know, the saddle dam is built of, you know, something really erodible. Let's say we've got a sandy embankment and, you know, the main dam is going to be um, uh, a, a dense compacted clay, for example. So the saddle dam is going to erode and breach much quicker. If you if the failure of the saddle dam would preclude an overtopping breach of the main dam, then yes, you would just take maximum of those two, which would be the the saddle dam. So you could do that, but again, you'd have to explain why because that's a little bit different than what we typically do for an SQRA. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Thanks. That makes sense. Yep. Very good. I go through the calculation of the non-breach probability again. Okay. So again, the, the non-breach probability is going to be equal to one minus the sum of the adjusted system response probabilities. So for the no failure, or for the no flood, excuse me, it's going to be one minus the sum of these values in the first row. So then for down here, basically what I'm doing is I'm taking one minus the sum of all of these probabilities on these branches. That's the exact same thing as I just showed you in the table. So the reason we do this is um, when we have event tree branches coming off of a single node, they have to be collectively exhausted and summed to one. So if I know the probabilities of one, two, three, four, and five, to make it collectively exhausted, the remainder is going to be my no failure or one minus the sum of. A uh, question: My total probability of value was correct. However, the non-breach values from the end probability table were not. Calculate the non-values. I did one minus the sum of the end node probabilities of the failures. Um, so the end node probabilities, no, the end node probabilities will not be collectively exhaustive because they are weighted by the probability of the flood. So if you did that, you should get Oops, that didn't work at all. One minus the sum of the end nodes. You're going to get close, but I, yeah, I don't, I don't see any point where you would ever want to do anything like that. So again, the end node probabilities are being weighted by the flood probability. So these, this branch right here, altogether. 
dots sum up to one, these end nodes will sum up to be the probability of the no flood. So if I were to sum these up, I should get 0 0.54. And then the other should sum again to there. So then the total of everything will be one. Does that answer your question, hopefully? Very good. So just to reiterate, the branches coming off of a single node, these branches, these probabilities will be selectively exhaustive. The end node probabilities will not be, again, because they're weighted by, you know, the probabilities and tables beforehand. Um, Dave, you say you have a question about values. What's up? Hey, Damien, yes, I had a question about some of the values. I was just comparing. Um, this isn't on the homework, but it's on um, exercise 1.3. And I just wanted to see if I was doing the right calculations, and I think that I was, but um, in some of the tabulated values that you have on the uh, the slides for uh, exercise 1.3 in the um, adjusted system response probabilities, I noticed as I got down to um, from pool 760 down to 770, mine are a little different. And I was wondering if they are, is that necessarily mean, you know, that it's it's wrong? Uh, for some reason, I seem consistent uh, from the, like I have for, um, you know, PFM1 at 754.9, you had a 2.14, and mine was coming back at 2.17. Okay. Um, and then it, it, it seemed they're close, but I was just kind of curious why, how come that, there's that difference? And I'm pretty sure I'm using the right formula. Okay. Um, I'll say that it's hard for me to know without um, looking at it specifically. Um, if, I don't know if you were doing these by, I mean, you, are you doing these in the spreadsheet like here or trying to do them more by hand? No, I was doing doing them in the spreadsheet. Um, okay. So for uh, pool seven twenty eight, um, you know the adjusted system response probabilities. I drag the formula across and get all the same answers that you had. But then, um, as it starts going down towards the different pools, there seems to start becoming a variation okay one thing i will say about competing risk is these are very dependent on um again what we calculated for the prior step and um little changes can make bigger changes in the outcome i i don't have an answer for you without looking at your spreadsheet if, if you want um after I've got all the other questions, we can stay on the line and I can um, take a look and see if there's a difference. Um, okay. The other, op the other option is I will be sending out, either me or somebody's going to be sending out uh, participants, uh, the solution files for the homework, and then also they'll have the solutions for the exercises as well. So you'll have that if you want to compare to that as That'd be helpful. Okay. Thanks. Very good. Cool. A any other questions? I think we've probably exhausted the questions about the homework. Were there any questions about module one in general or any of the uh, topics covered there? Ah, can you, I've been asked if I can point you to the section of the YouTube video where the secret word is for the quiz. Yeah, so the, calling it the, the buzzword, it, it, it's not in the module one video. The buzzword is going to come from um, this live session right now. And in fact, since you asked for it, 
good as good as time as any to go ahead and give it to you all. So the the buzzword that you guys are going to need uh, for module one is independent, independent. So the whole purpose of this buzzword is to make sure that um, you guys get credit for participating in this session. If you're here live, you'll get it um, because I'm, you know you you'll hear me say the buzzword, whatever. But if you miss this and have to watch the video, I guess this is my way of making sure that you watch the entire video or at least scan through until you find the buzzword. I guess it's not perfect, but and we'll we'll say it at different times, so it's not always going to be towards the end or the middle or wherever. So it shouldn't be too bad if you um, do what you're supposed to do and either participate live or or watch the full video, but. So the buzzword for this one is going to be independent. If nobody has any questions, that's as good a segue as any to talk about uh, the Socrative quiz where you're going to use that buzzword. So to get to officially get credit for uh, participating in the live Q&A, I ask that you complete a quiz on Socrative. Go to www.socrative.com and then under login, we'll choose the student login. And then that'll ask you for a room name. For this module, it's going to be DLS 105R1. And then when you click join, it'll give you the spot to enter your name. Please enter your last name first and then click done. And then that'll take you to the multiple choice quiz. The, um, the first quiz question is going to be um, to the, uh, pick the buzzword from a multiple choice list. And then after that, there's going to be uh, five multiple choice questions uh, related to the module one content. Uh, you should be able to find, uh, find the answers to there. Um, just by looking through the presentations, if you don't um, know it right offhand, I mean, it's open book, open note, and then there might be a few uh, simple calculations to do. But again, they're all multiple choice, and a lot of these questions are going to show up on the final exam on the end. Uh, it's worth your while to do your best and see how well things stuck from that first module. Any questions on the buzzword or the quiz or anything like that? So the question is the deadline to take the quiz. Um, yes, you can take it later in the week. Basically, the deadline is between now and the next live session. So you've got, you know, three weeks to go through and, and do that. Uh, there is no time limit for the exam. Wendy, you might have to correct me, but I don't, once you get in to take the quiz, I don't, can you do half of it, leave and come back, or I don't know if you can go in and out, though. Yeah, Wendy says she doesn't think so. So whenever you're ready to take the quiz, um, go take it. The quiz shouldn't take you more than 10 minutes or so. Um, so that shouldn't be too bad. Uh, and one more time, the buzzword is independent. Independent. Uh, if for some reason the internet disconnects during the quiz, can we re-log in and take it? Yes. Yeah, I think that's fine. Uh, do you recommend watching the video module before office hours? Yes, typically. So again, office hours is the, the, a, basically an informal time to ask questions about the module or get help with the homework. Uh, in, in past offerings of the sessions, I'd heard horror stories of participants getting stuck on the homework, and they'd t come back telling me they spent you know several hours on it and just couldn't get it. And I don't want anybody you know spinning their wheels on something if you don't understand and it's not quite clear. So you know, if if after, you know, 15, 20 minutes, it's not making sense and, you know, you can't figure out the homework, um, please reach out either via email or call.
call into the office hours and ask your questions and get some help. I don't, I don't want these homework assignments to be a burden. They're just, again, an opportunity to, to practice the concepts and to reinforce what you learned from the video module. All right, if no one has anything else, let's talk about module two real quick. So when we get into module two, this is going to be start getting into more of the calculations that we do and uh, the portrayal. Because the calculations can be, I find that when I'm trying to learn math, that it's best to follow along an example and kind of write it down and do it yourself. So with module two in your exercises and homework file, there is a couple tabs in there, one called presentation example and one called example solution. So as we go through the module, we're going basically going through a big example. So the spreadsheet is set up to be a companion to the module. And we say that in the video, but anywhere you see in the bottom left corner of a slide that says presentation example, again, that's a calculation that is, it's, it's set up for you to do within the spreadsheet. So that's going to help you follow along. It's going to help you practice. You know, the risk calculations is really a learn by doing kind of thing. So um, that allows you to do it as you follow along, and then um, you can kind of bounce back and forth when we get to the um, exercises that um, touch on some of these different concepts. So. The presentation example is basically going to be a spreadsheet with blank tables set up to where you can do these calculations. And then the example solution is going to be the exact same thing, but with the solution already in there. That way, if as you're following along, you're punching stuff in, it doesn't quite come out right, you can click over to the example solution, um, see for, look for any differences, see where you might have made a mistake, and get it corrected without spending too much time. So hopefully that makes sense and hopefully you find it helpful as you walk through the module. Um, there's a question is how do we handle if we miss the homework deadline? Please try to be on time, but at the same time I understand that, you know, everybody's a professional here, you know, you've got your main job responsibilities that should take priority. So if you're a little late, just, just send me an email and, you know, I'll work with you. Seems like, especially once we start getting to the middle end of the course, people in the past have had trouble getting at risk installed and um, or getting delayed. But really, as long as everybody's given an honest attempt on the homework, if it's a little late, that's okay. As long as it gets completed before the, the course is up. And then just as a reminder, all of the module two stuff should already be posted. The website, we go to the same places to watch the videos and then they get copies of the transcripts and presentations. And we should be all set. All right, so if nobody has any other questions, we'll call that a wrap for the module one live Q&A. If, you know, if, as you're working through things, if other questions pop up, related to this module or any other, as always, feel free to reach out via email or um, via office hours, either way. Well, thank you guys for your time and enjoy the rest of your day and we'll catch you in a few weeks.